Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us here in the Mets in Narragansett, Rhode Island at the South County Museum and all of you out there who are tuning in via YouTube stream. We appreciate all of you joining us tonight for our second installment of Rhode Island Civil War Week 2021. Please mark your calendar because we're already setting a group of uh, speakers and reenactments for next year, the last week of July. So I hope you'll mark it in your calendar now. Tonight, I have the pleasure of presenting Patrick Donovan, who's going to talk about his effort, along with the Varnum Armory, to conserve civil war in Rhode Island and its significant history. The contributions and those who actually died serving Rhode Island South. We don't always make the connection with the Civil War up north, but it definitely had a great impact on all of us. I'd like to also thank our partners, other than the Varnum Armory, the Rhode Island Genealogical Society, who has helped set up this meeting so that we could be virtual and have many people from across the nation join us for tonight. With that, I'm going to introduce Patrick Donovan. Thank you. It's uh, good to see that we have a good turnout tonight, particularly on such a beautiful Friday evening. I was worried that we wouldn't have too many people showing up on a Friday, but pleasantly surprised. So thank you for being here. Hopefully this will be well worth your time. Uh, I brought two very special artifacts, two of the most epic objects in our entire collection. Uh, I'm always nervous to take those objects out of the museum, um, but I thought it was important to, to show you guys uh, to hopefully have an impact. So again, my name is Patrick Donovan. I'm the vice president of the Varnum Continentals, Inc. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. We're all volunteer. All of us consider our work uh, to be labor of, a labor of love, if you will. And it's been our mission, next slide. It's been our mission since 1907 to preserve and share Rhode Island's military history and heritage. And we do that with the ultimate aim to promote patriotism, and to encourage service, service of all kinds, not necessarily military service, but we hope that the emotional stories that we tell about Rhode Islanders in wartime, we hope that that encourages people to serve their fellow man. Uh, I love this old picture. This is, uh, oh, go back. And then down. So this is our very first parade. When the Varnum Continentals first formed in 1907, we were a state-chartered militia. Uh, today, we refer to the militia as a historic military command because, unfortunately, militia has sort of a negative connotation today as being right-wing, anti-government. I can assure you we're not that type of, of militia. Uh, mili militias uh, obviously had a, they had a very strong impact on American history. Before the Civil War, the federal government, right up just in the years before the Civil War, the federal government had only authorized about 7,000 federal soldiers. And most of those soldiers are spread out along the frontier. And so the government, state governments, local governments, federal government, they depended on citizen volunteer militias to step up in times of need. And Rhode Island has a very strong tradition of that. Virtually every town of any significance had a militia at one point. And many of those militias exist today in ceremonial uh, fashion. But I love this picture. This is Main Street, East Greenwich, 1908. I think it's July, but it's our very first parade. So we serve our mission uh, by owning and operating two museum properties. We have the Varnum House Museum located on Pierce Street, just behind the town hall in East Greenwich. And then we also have, of course, the Varnum Armory Museum located right on Main Street. You cannot miss it. It's a large castle building, beautiful building. We've, it's gone through a lot of renovations of late. You can see the green trim along the turrets. We just had uh, all of the soffits, the trim work, uh, repaired, replaced, painted anew. We had the brick cleaned. Uh, we've redone, uh, done a lot of uh, mortar work on the brick. The doors have been uh, rebuilt. We re-finished uh, the original light fixtures on the front of the armory. 
Uh, even the original sandwich board where we put our little sign uh, is the original from the 1920s, and we just restored that. We had it rebuilt. Uh, so also another word about who we are. So the Varnum House. So we're named after James Mitchell Varnum. He uh, born in Drake at Mass. He moves. He goes to school, actually, at Rhode Island College, which later becomes Brown University, studies law. He moves to East Greenwich. He opens a law office, so he's a lawyer. He's a two-term member of the Continental Congress. Uh, he was one of the founders of the Kentish Guard Militia in 1774, along with Nathaniel Green. And um, he would go on to become a brigade commander in George Washington's Continental Line Army. And he would, late in the war, come back to Rhode Island. He would be commissioned a major general and put in command of all Rhode Island militia forces late in the Revolutionary War. And then after the war, he would become a judge. And I'm always amazed he does all of this work before the age of 40, uh, which makes me feel like a slacker. Uh, but anyway, we adopted his name uh, for our organization. And we purchased the James Mitchell Varnum House it's located right on the hill in East Greenwich. Uh, we bought that in 1939. And over the last five years, uh, we've raised, and uh, through grants as well, of course, uh, we put hundreds of thousands of dollars into the renovation of the house. It's a beautiful property today, inside and out. It's been totally redone. The original, um, the 1850s era wallpaper that's in the mo throughout much of the, the first floor of the house, it's hand painted in China. That was completely restored. Um, it's in beautiful condition now. And the house is open uh, for free. And it's open all weekends, Saturdays and Sundays, uh, now during the summer. So if you haven't been to the Varnum House, I encourage you to do that. Next slide. So I hate this. You kind of have to say this, because this is an important lesson, I think. I, I, this is not to point fingers at anybody or to lay blame, per se. But when the current leadership of the Varnum Continentals came in, roughly around 2013, 2014, the armory was in very bad decay, and the house was as well. Uh, they just, uh, it was under poor management for some period of time. The roof leaked for years. Uh, the mortar was failing. Uh, you could literally take a vacuum cleaner and suck bricks out of the wall. That's how bad it was up high in the building. The museum, uh, the last curator who had done a very good job, he had become very ill, and he was very protective of the collection, and he resisted others helping and assisting. And uh, consequently, the museum sat with no climate control in a basement environment, if you can imagine, for years without any care. And so by the time that we came in, uh, there was mold everywhere. All of the, the wood framing was covered in mold. Uh, there was moths eating the uniforms. Um, it was just, it was really sad to see. I don't want to overemphasize that. Most of the collection has survived in good shape. Uh, we did lose some pieces I'm going to show. But just as an example of what we walked into, so this is uh, what's known as the pool room. And in that case, is some incredible Civil War, Rhode Island Civil War artifacts. There's a uh, cavalry uh, shell jacket on the left that belonged to Lyman Aylesworth of North Kingstown. He served the entire war. He was in over 30 battles and campaigns. Uh, he escaped the war without a scratch. Um, next to it in the center is Captain uh, James Chase of Providence, Rhode Island. He was a uh, lieutenant and captain in Battery B, 1st Rhode Island Light Artillery, all the major battles of the Eastern Theater. He was a POW. He survives the war. That's his frock coat, his pants, his sash. And then to the right of him is a Confederate general's frock coat uh, that belonged, um, I'm totally spacing his name. He was a uh, Confederate general who served under General Pemberton at Vicksburg. He was a major Confederate general in the Western Theater. Uh, Francis Cockrell, that was his name. And his family, after the war, settled in uh, Warwick, Rhode Island. And the family had donated his uniform to us in the early 1900s. But they're literally just hanging on wire coat hangers, not well displayed. Uh, it was pretty alarming. Next slide. Here's another picture to show kind of some of the damage. The, the uh, bearskin hat on the left is uh, 
Providence First Light Infantry Officer's uh, Shaco hat from about 1850. And you can see the moth damage to that. There's a, um, a can an Army campaign hat from the Spanish-American War that's covered in white mold, and you can see the gun stock and mold. It was just a very sad situation. Keep going. A lot of the textiles had severe moth damage. This is, uh, this is actually James Chase's Civil War frock coat. You can see the damage that was incurred. Next slide. This, sadly, is uh, Howard Vernon Allen's Varnum Continental dress coat. He was one of our founders of our organization. He was our longest serving commander from 1916 to 1969. He, he commanded the unit, and his office was there. He's responsible for a lot of the collection that's in the building today, but you can you see the terrific, horrific damage that was, that was done. Kind of inside of a display case. Next slide. So one of the very first things we did is we installed climate control in the museum rooms of the armory. And we paid for it out of our own pocket. It only cost us $32,000 to climate control um, the museum level. And then uh, Champlin Foundation uh, actually retroactively paid us back for that investment. Um, so that was, that was fantastic. But one of the, the other big things that we did right away is buy chest freezers, 200 bucks at Lowe's, Every single textile in our collection, and we have over 200 19th century Rhode Island military uniforms, militia uniforms, everything went through the freezer. You leave it in the freezer for three to four days. You take it out. You let it warm up. You put it back in the freezer for another three days. So we were putting uniforms in garbage bags and putting them in these freezers, and we did this for months to get through all of them. And anytime someone brings a textile to our collection, there's always a risk that there's a bug in that coat, and that bug could wreak havoc on the rest of the museum. So everything goes into this freezer uh, first. Very low cost investment. And uh, so this is, a, this is a slide that kind of highlights all the efforts that we did in the last few years. A lot of people involved. Uh, Andy Santilli in the lower left, he's our general contractor. Uh, he's phenomenal. He's been a godsend to our organization just to help keep the building going. He does a lot of the museum display cases for us. Um, John Fisher in the middle, cleaning our toy soldier collection. There's a flag that we found in one of the rooms. It's a silk state of Rhode Island flag from, the eight, from about 1870 uh, that, was, that we're gonna have conserved. And then in the lower right picture, these are military officer shoulder epaulets that go on your, on your dress uniform. Those happen to be from the 1880s. They're Providence First Light Infantry Militia uh, epaulets. But you can see the difference on the left and the right. The right is before cleaning, and the left is after it's been cleaned. And this is an art form. It's very easy to destroy the value of a military object by overcleaning. You don't want to remove the original patina. You don't want to remove its history. But at the same time, you have to remove active corrosion. You have to. Anything that's happened, you know, recently surface stuff, you want to get that off of the object. And then all of our metal objects, wood, in some cases leather, we use what you can see in the picture on the far right corner, Renaissance wax. It's a micro crystalline wax that uh, museums commonly use. It's cheap. You can buy it on Amazon. You take a little bit on a cloth and you just kind of rub it on the object very lightly. You wait. 30 seconds, and then you buff it off with a dry cloth, paper towel, and that seals the object from the environment as long as you don't handle it um, too much. But you can't touch it with your hands. The oil in your fingers won't cause rust, that sort of thing. So it kind of seals it and helps keep uh, corrosion at bay. But the biggest boon for our conservation efforts is this young woman, uh, Maria Vasquez. She is a professional textile conservator. She has a master's degree in textile conservation from the University of Rhode Island. And I learned about her through Clouds Hill Victorian House Museum on Post Road in Warwick, another gem in our state that if you haven't been to, I highly encourage you to go visit. It's an amazing house. It's considered the most original Victorian house in America. Anyway, she was doing volunteer work there, and she was looking for a place to do volunteer work. She's trying to build up her resume. So long story short, we have built a textile conservation lab in uh, part of our museum. 
and uh, I get her paying jobs. And then in exchange for that, she does our work for free. And in this picture is a beautiful, very rare uh, musician's coat, artillery musician's coat from the Civil War. And if you look between her and that coat is a gentleman wearing that very coat. His name was William Lewis. When the Civil War breaks out, he's 16 years old. He has four siblings. His father was a known liar. He had mental issues. And at the outbreak of the Civil War, he abandons the family, leaves in the middle of the night, and never sees him again. Uh, William, he's 16 years old, with his mother's permission, lies about his age, and he enlists to fight in the Civil War. He ends up in Battery G, 1st Rhode Island Light Artillery. And according to all accounts in their history, written by Rob Grandchamp, in fact, um, he sent basically every penny he made, he would send home to his family so his family could survive. He becomes a corporal. And at some point early in the war, he is busted for cowardice in the face of the enemy. We don't know what the exact details of that incident were, whether that was deserving or not. But they took his stripes away, and he happened to play the trumpet or the bugle, and they made him the bugler for, the, for his company. And he became, becomes a musician. And he, on leave, he gets this coat, we think in Providence, a non-regulation artillery coat. This is very valuable in the collector's market today. Um, but he's wearing the coat in that picture. That picture was taken in Providence when he's on leave, early in 1864. About three months after he has this photograph taken, uh, the Battle of Cedar Creek happens. Uh, Confederates attack, surprise morning attack. Uh, Battery G gets a little bit of a warning that they're under attack, and they hitch up their cannons, and they're getting ready to, to move to a different position. And the Confederates, it becomes a hand-to-hand -hand combat. And at one point, they grab two of their cannons, and they pull, start pulling the guns away. They hitch it to a team of horses. In their history, in letters written by other soldiers, William Lewis jumps on his horse. He goes at a full gallop and catches up to the train that's pulling the gun away, the team of horses, and he gets alongside that team of horses. He leaps from his horse, lands on top of the team, and somehow slows them down enough where other men in his company catch up, and they recapture their gun. They beat off the Confederates. They recapture their gun. And at that moment, William Lewis is shot to the chest. It goes in his rib cage on his right side and comes out his left. And William Lewis would linger in a field hospital for about two days before passing away. And he's still buried there today. And we have a copy of the letter that his, um, one of his friends wrote about his death, telling his mother about how he had, had died and talks about this, this bravery that he had exhibited. Um, very sad story, but amazing that this ends up in our museum. So the funny thing is, is that the picture, we didn't have a coat. And all of a sudden, I get a, a friend say, hey, this, uh, this dealer out in Massachusetts has a photograph of William Lewis in his bugler's coat. It's an albumin photograph. And I'm like, oh, we got to have that. So I actually bought it out of my own pocket and brought it in the museum. And it was like a few months later, another friend says, hey, I was at a museum, a Civil War museum in Petersburg, Virginia, and they have this coat that belongs to a Rhode Island soldier. And I'm like, ah, who's, you know, who is it? And uh, William Lewis. And then I see the picture of this coat, and I'm like, it can't be. And um, I ended up getting in contact with the director of that museum, and uh, he heartily, you know, he agreed happily to put the coat on loan to us for the next two years, hoping it's going to be a longer loan. Uh, we actually helped them with a, I helped him with an amazing U.S. Colored Troop collection. Uh, USCT, uh, about a hundred and eighty thousand dollar collection is now I made happen for them to be able to display that. So I'm hoping he's going to return the favor and allow us to to keep the coat for a while. But it's amazing that these two objects are now back together. Um, the other amazing thing we're going to I'll tell his story in a minute. But William Lewis fought shoulder to shoulder with James Chase. Do you remember me mentioning James, Captain James Chase, his frock coat? So they fought shoulder to shoulder at the Battle of Fredericksburg, Manning. Uh, the gun crew basically got shot down at their gun, and Chase 
and William got out their horses and they started working this gun together themselves. And uh, those two uniforms are now back to back in our museum, which I think is pretty amazing. Just some uh, pictures of what the museum looks like now, uh, completely different. Everything's been clean, renovated. All the objects have been cleaned and waxed and oiled. Uh, Maria's been spending hundreds of hours uh, conserving these uniforms. We have a partnership now with the Newport Naval War College Museum, and we're getting all of their second uh, museum cases. They're being put on long-term loan to us. So these beautiful mannequin cases, the, that case there with the slanted top, that has a collection of first Rhode Island detached militia stuff. Um, it's the first volunteer regiment to leave Rhode Island to fight. They fought at the Battle of Bull Run. Uh, we have the only known example of their very unique blanket that was made just for the first Rhode Island detached militia. It was designed by Ambrose Burnside. It doubled as a poncho, has a slit down the center. It's this unique red color. And that blanket is actually part of the South County Museum's collection. And they've graciously allowed us to display it uh, with these other first Rhode Island objects. Here's a painting done by the very well-known African-American artist Edward Bannister. It's of uh, Henry Tellinghast of East Greenwich. He's a Civil War officer. This painting was done in 1862. He fought at the Battle of Antietam. Um, beautiful painting. We have a, the sword below there is a, a sword that belonged to an officer in the 12th Rhode Island. He carried that sword at the Battle of Fredericksburg. This came up on the collector's market. I did a Facebook fundraiser. And um, the Civil War Roundtable, the Rhode Island chapter, gave us 1000 bucks, And the rest of the money I raised from everyday people on Facebook and we're able to buy this object and get it back into Rhode Island from out of state, which is great. Just another scene of the museum. The, the flag on the, that swallowtail flag, that is the only flag in Rhode Island history to have been captured by the enemy in battle. So that belonged to the first Rhode Island cavalry. And during the Gettysburg campaign, they got surrounded in Middleburg, Virginia, 285 Rhode Islanders fought for their lives over a 12-hour period. And after that battle, only about 60 survived. Most were captured, some killed, many wounded. But that flag was captured by North Carolina Confederates, ends up in a museum in North Carolina for 140-some years. And in 2008, they decided to return the flag uh, back to Rhode Island. And it's been here ever since. We actually uh, had the flag conserved. It was put in a cardboard box, thrown in a closet, and then um, we offered it with our own money to pay for the conservation. So why do we do all this stuff? It's for scenes like this. I love the impact that we have on people that come into our museum, the emotional impact that our stories have on people. And I wrote an essay, a short essay, don't worry, about why I think military history is important and worth saving and protecting and remembering. So I'd like to just read that if you'll permit me. So the, the title of this is The Value of American History. So I believe the teaching and sharing of American history can help us come together as a country through the realization that we have a shared story of our national birth and development, a shared identity, an identity made up of both good and bad history. We shouldn't shy away from the bad or try to cover it up. We should embrace it. We should square ourselves and look at it directly. After all, we should remember that we are not those people who came before us. We might be descendants, but we are not them. There's no call to feel responsible or to feel shame for ugly things that have happened before we were born. Yes, we are in part products of that past. But I believe to move forward, we should look at and treat each other as individuals based on our own merits and character, not as members of a group and certainly not as people from the distant past. And we shouldn't overemphasize the negative. As Americans, we can all look back on this past and feel gratitude in how far we have come as a country, regardless of our race, creed, political persuasion, or when you or your family came to, to this country. I believe the arc of American history is a very positive one, constantly moving and bending further towards its ideals. It was America, who gave birth to and fostered freedom and individual rights in a time when the world was completely run by despots, dictators, and royalty. Yes, there have been bad people, bad acts, and bad governments, 
But by and by, taken as a whole, we should feel a pride and love for the role our nation has played in the world. Without question, the greatest factor, the greatest driving force behind the massive improvement in the world's standard of living and well-being over the last few hundred years is liberty. And we have been overwhelmingly responsible for the spread of that liberty around the world. And our military hi history and heritage is a big piece of that evolving history. Military history can affect each and every one of us in positive ways on a very personal level. Uh, a couple of years ago, I gave a tour to a group of high school age special needs kids from Warwick Transition School. How do you talk about war and weapons to children, let alone special needs kids? It's a challenge. One kid in particular got very upset over the presence of a Nazi flag. Why? That's evil, he exclaimed. But we ended up having a moving and emotional group discussion on if war is terrible and ugly, why should we remember it? And why should we keep its artifacts? The kids got it, I think. There was the obvious remember the sacrifices of those who served and remember the past to avoid making the same mistakes type of talk. But we also talked about how war history presents us with context and perspective to our own personal lives. When we feel down or anxious about our problems, it's good to think what others have gone through and what they've faced in war. It helps us realize our troubles likely aren't so bad. History shows us we're not alone. It acts as a guidepost. It shows us the way forward. It gives us hope that we too can persevere through whatever it is that faces us. War and all of its death and destruction gives us incredible examples of courage and kindness. It gives us role models who have demonstrated the greatest of human virtues under the absolute worst circumstances possible. After all, it's easy to be kind and giving when times are good, but to do it when people are shooting at you is quite another, isn't it? It is good for people to learn about and reflect on the soldier's ability to stand their ground and protect their buddies while scared to death under fire. This courage is something all of us should admire and aspire to have. This tour for these special kids, <clears throat> they've made me realize that preserving and sharing the past is not really about the past at all, but is actually all about helping humanity's future. Next. All right, now I'm gonna share some of the really cool projects that we've been involved with. Um, one day, a uh, year and a half ago, I get a phone call from the town clerk of Bristol, Rhode Island. And they said, hey, we have a stand of flags and uh, they're old. We we've had them for at least since 1883 when the Burnside Memorial Building opened as the Burnside Mausoleum, as the Museum de Ambrose Burnside. Can you help us with this? Can you come take a look and see what these things are? And uh, so, me, sorry, back. Uh, Maria and I went there and we took the flags out and they're wrapped in plastic, modern plastic, taped shut in a room with no climate control. We cut the plastic off two of them. We start to unfurl them and they literally started just turning to dust and breaking into pieces. We're like, stop, I'm like, we can't do this here. Long story short, I presented to the town council. I made a case, say, hey, let us take them out. We'll evaluate them in our lab and we'll decide if any are worth conserving. Uh, we'll conserve them at our cost, but they have to stay at the armory. They cannot go back to where they were. And to their great credit, they unanimously voted yes. And so we brought these eight flags out. No, next slide, sorry. And uh, first step was, if you look at the top center picture, we, Andy, our contractor, made this, uh, I call it the ghetto uh, humidification chamber. And we laid these flags in there and we, we bought little humidifiers at the hardware store and we filled it with moist air. And we did this for two weeks. We kept the humidity at like 60%. We gently raised it to soften the fabric so that we could unroll these things with as little damage as possible. And so we did that for some weeks and then you can see the condition that they were in. We had big hopes. I thought this is gonna be a stand of flags belonging to General Ambrose Burnside it's been in his, his museum after he died in 1881. They built this building specifically to memorialize him, and it was like a Civil War museum. Rob Grandchamp thought the big flag was going to be his Ninth Corps headquarters flag, which if that were the case, that was going to be a national news story. So we were all 
you know, jazzed up, and we had to wait weeks before we could unfurl them. And there's some pictures here showing us start to unfurl them. Go ahead and uh, we actually did this live, well, not live, but it was filmed by Rhode Island PBS as we're unfurling these flags. It took an entire day. And it turned out we thought we had six flags, but we had eight. And at some point, it got, for conservation, it got exciting. You see Maria up on the table there. Uh, it's a good action shot undoing a, that's an 1870s flag. Turns out most of the flags were Civil War veteran flags. Cool, great local history, a couple of them worth, you know, conserving, but we were kind of feeling let down kind of mid, midpoint in the day. Uh, next. Oh, it's not quite the order I wanted to go in, but there were out of the eight flags, there are two epic flags, and this is one of them. This was actually the last flag that we opened up. That's a called a great star pattern flag, where the stars are arranged one large star like that. It's not a regulation flag. Um, there are 33 stars, 1861. Ooh, now I'm getting excited. This is Civil War, this is our first Civil War flag. And then uh, if you look at the top of the blue field, you can see a lighter blue thing. There's period repairs all over this flag that were, you can tell uh, looking at the, the uh, threads under a microscope using a black light, you can tell if that thread is in the last 100 years or older. So we could tell that this thing had been worked on way back then. There are also what we believe are blood stains on the flag and potentially battle damage. So we think this was carried during the war. Next. So we think we're building a case that this is the flag presented to Company G of the Second Rhode Island Volunteers just before they left Rhode Island to go to Washington, D.C., and eventually they fight at Bull Run. They're the first Union infantry in the American Civil War to fight the Confederates in combat um, on the field of battle. And this picture is in the Bristol Phoenix. It's a front page story. It's a picture of Company G in front of a house in, that's on Main Street today. And they're being presented this handmade flag by the ladies of Bristol. But the picture's washed out. You can't quite tell is that our flag or not. Um, but I'm, I'm actually building a case um, that it is their flag. Uh, in 1876, there's a Bristol Phoenix article about the Bristol Fourth of July parade. In the article, it mentions another flag that we have in this group of eight that was being carried, and next to it was the flag carried by Company G of the Second Rhode Island. So these two flags, I think, have always been together. Of the eight flags stored in the Burnside Memorial, this 33-star pattern flag was the only flag from the Civil War period. Being that it's 33-star, it would date to 1861, which is appropriate to the time when this was presented. Um, being a company's national colors, this is not standard for a company to carry the American flag into battle. It was given to them by civilians. It would make sense that the flag would not have become property of the state. The reason why this flag still exists in Bristol is because it's not a regimental colors. So that fits you know, the idea of citizens presenting this flag to Company G. Um, the Great Star pattern is not a government standard. It's not regulation. So it's consistent with something that the ladies of Bristol, quote unquote, would have made. The flag's hoist design, so the, the edge of the flag that's on the flagpole, has hand-sewn rivet holes, little rivets down the side. And this is very characteristic of a homemade flag. Uh, it's also characteristic of Rhode Island-made flags. We have other Rhode Island-made flags in our collection that have the same rivet pattern. The stars, so it's silk, two layers of silk, and on the inside of the two layers of silk are paper cut stars. It's a quilting technique of the time. This is not, paper stars would not have been used in a normal military, uh, you know, depot made flag. So I think that's another sign that this is a homemade flag made by home quilters. Um, so anyway, we're, I believe it's the second Rhode Island um, company G. Now look at the, if you go back one slide, sorry, the, the condition of the flag, it's in pieces. A lot of it's gone. You know, what could we possibly do with this thing to make it displayable again? 
to go down two slides. This is an example. Um, this is the is it the 91st Pennsylvania Regimental National Colors. Uh, you can see what it looked like on the left, very much like our flag, and then you can see what it looks like conserved on the right. It's it's magic what these conservators are able to do. So Maria is going to copy this technique. She's literally going to fabricate out of the same type of materials a replica of the original flag, and then over the top you literally glue down the original flag on top and you, you get the result that you see on the right. It's painstaking process. It's gonna take her an immense amount of time. Uh, but we're gonna start that project actually this, uh, this fall. Next. This is uh, one of the, I think is a beautiful, this is a Civil War veteran flag. The Babbitt Post was a Grand Army of the Republic post. It's a veteran organization, national organization. And the Babbitt Post was the local Bristol chapter where the veterans would meet, named after Jacob Babbitt, killed at the Battle of Fredericksburg. It's a beautiful hand-painted flag, but just look at the condition on the left, and then the, that's the same flag on the right. I mean, it's just amazing uh, what she was able to, to do on that. It's like magic. This is not Civil War, but I, I got to tell the story because it's, it's uh, probably the most valuable object in our building today. We knew we had a really special flag because on the end of the flagpole is this finial, and it's engraved on three sides. And I know nothing about Bristol history. I know very little about pre-Revolutionary War American colonial history. So we're reading this, and it says, the gift of Colonel Nathaniel Byfield to the first company of militia. Next one. Captain Nathaniel Byfield, 1687. Now we're getting excited. Next one. Bristol for the time being 1724. Long story short, we have a flag that dates to 1695. It was purchased by Nathaniel Byfield. He's the founder, one of the founders, three founders of Bristol, Rhode Island. He comes from England, uh, moves, I think it's 17, or 1673. Uh, he serves in King Philip's War. He's a very wealthy guy. He um, buys land in Bristol, for, forms the town, and he becomes the colonel of the Bristol County Militia, which tended to be wealthy individuals that would be the colonel. The colonel was responsible for outfitting the militia, and we found a period reference where he purchases a stand of colors for his company um, in 1695. And so that's this flag. It's Today, it's golden color, beautiful silk, and uh, the tassels there on the top. And we were really baffled when we first unfurled it because we're expecting to see something painted in the center of the, of the flag. And we're unrolling it slowly over the course of an hour. We're like, there's nothing on it. Like, what the heck is it? It's just a plain gold banner. And that confused us. Again, I don't know a lot about that history and part of the, our history. The militia organization system in time, in vogue at that time, was called the VEN military system, V-E-N-N. -N. And the banner, the flag for the colonel's company, Company A of the first uh, of the regiment of the militia, was a plain red silk banner with nothing on it. That was the company's company, the colonel's company, excuse me. And it turns out that this used to be red. So we had a colonial dye expert from the University of Rhode Island come out. Um, we took samples, looked at it under microscope. There's traces of red on the inside of the, the sleeve where the pole goes. There's traces of red on the inside of the tassels. So we know this used to be red. Um, next. You can see kind of a before and after. Uh, big difference. Next. She spent hours combing out the fringe on this flag to get it to lay down and then sewed it down. We uh, purchased silk crepeling, this fine silk mesh, and we had it custom dyed at the University of Rhode Island. They have a, a, a lab for making custom dyes, and they did it for us for free, which is wonderful, but we dyed it to match the flag, and so the silk crepeling goes over the Byfield flag, and it's sewn down to the backing board to you know, hold it in place. That's the flag all laid out. In the lower right is this stain and splatter. And we're all looking at it and we're thinking, we're all thinking blood, but no one wanted to say it. And we've since had material culture experts, people familiar with old textiles of blood, 
We believe it to be blood. Um, this is not widely known yet, but uh, the, there's a, the National Museum of the U.S. Army, the curator of that museum came up recently and, and flew up here, spent a few days with us. We're going to put this flag on display at the, at the National U.S. Army Museum um, from 2025 to 2027, basically to cover the anniversary, the 250th anniversary of our country. And they want to be part of the PBS documentary that we're making about the flag. And they're going to test for, they're going to carbon date the flag. They're going to test for blood. And if we get a positive test for blood, uh, we're going to do DNA testing. And the DNA testing, if they can get a decent enough sample, is going to tell us, I, I didn't realize how much they could get from this stuff. But um, obviously the uh, nationality, the race, age, sex, um, hair color, eye color, shape of the face, um, all kinds of interesting details. We believe the flag was used in either King William's War or Queen Anne's War, two wars that I had completely forgotten from my schooling, so I had to, to look that up. But um, these were intracolonial conflicts with uh, French Canada and various Indian tribes that were allied with the Massachusetts Bay Colony and New France. Very violent conflicts, actually. But we think, we know that Bristol County militiamen served in these, these battle, in these wars. And so we think this flag may have been used there. Uh, Andy built this beautiful maple display case. Next slide. This is a picture I took yesterday. We just had the glass uh, brought in. Um, the Army's going to put it in a new case. They said that the case that they're going to build is going to cost $30,000. And um, we get to keep the case when they're done with it after the two years. So we'll use this for another flag. All right, now we'll get back to the Civil War. So what do I start with first? We got the uh, front page of the Providence Journal for this. Um, how do I tell this? So Battery B, 1st Rhode Island Light Artillery. They're in all the major battles of the Eastern Theater of the American Civil War. At the Battle of Gettysburg, they're commanded by T. Fred Brown, Thomas Frederick Brown. And um, they are right in the center of the action on day two and day three of that battle. So to, to refresh people, Gettysburg, uh, General Robert E. Lee and his Army of Northern Virginia invades into the north. They move down up the Shenandoah Valley, um, and they end up. Uh, the two armies meet at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, South Central Pennsylvania. They fight between July 1st and July 3rd. It's about 170,000 Americans fighting each other over this three-day period. By the end of the battle, there was approximately 52,000 killed, wounded, or missing, just epic in scale. It's the biggest battle in the American Civil War, the highest casualties, um, the largest number engaged. And Battery B is right in the midst of this. Um, so on the second day of the battle, Battery B, after marching 25 miles a day for several days, they arrive at the battlefield, and they're placed right in the center of the Union line on Cemetery Ridge. And late in the afternoon of July 2nd, uh, the Confederate Army um, under James Longstreet, the First uh, Corps, they attack uh, from the south up to the north towards where Battery B's position was. They, they come across and uh, attack. Battery B for, um, is placed perpendicular to the main line at some point in that afternoon. They're actually, the main Union line is behind a stone wall. And Battery B is placed 300 yards in advance of the main line, and they're facing north. And they're engaged with a, another artillery battery at Lee's headquarters, and they're going back and forth, firing at each other. And they're expecting to be relocated to the south to help General Sickles out near the Peach Orchard. And at some point, uh, rising up out of a swale in the ground, uh, 1,500 Howling Georgians, Wright's Brigade, um, 1,500 Georgians against roughly 120 Rhode Islanders manning cannons armed with maybe a sword, maybe a pistol. And uh, they're coming into their flank, and it becomes hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, they lose a gun. Fred Brown commander of the batteries on horseback 
and he has the presence of mind to, to gather the battery, get most of the guns hitched up to horses, and begin to pull the battery back to the main Union line behind the stone wall. And that stone wall ends at one point. There's a gap, and the wall starts again. And this little gap, it's only maybe, I don't know, 25 yards long. Today, that gap is still there. You can still see it today. And it's known as Brown's Gate because he led, he pulled the battery back through this hole in the wall. He gets just inside the gate, and he's on his horse, and he's holding a pistol in the air, and he's leaned over, and he's yelling at another officer. And at that moment, he's shot through the neck. And it goes in, nicks his carotid artery, and goes out the back. And he falls from his horse. He's bleeding. He loses consciousness. He's left for dead on the battlefield. And uh, eventually, reinforcements come up. They beat off Wright's brigade. They retreat. And they grab Fred Brown's body. And they bring him back to the line. Fred uh, survives. He ends up in a hospital. He returns to his battery months later. Um, now fast forward 30 years after the battle. And uh, the Wright's Brigade, members of these Georgia regiments, are trying to figure out where on the battlefield they reach. So they want to they put a monument on the field. All these veterans come back to Gettysburg in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s to place monuments in memory of their, their actions there. The Georgians knew that they had attacked a Rhode Island battery. So Simeon Theus, a soldier in one of those Georgian regiments, writes a letter to the Providence Journal. And he says, pretty sure they, um, they'll remember who we were, but we, we know we attacked a Rhode Island battery. Can you help us get in contact with them? And the Providence Journal takes his letter, and he, they, they give it to Fred Brown. And Fred Brown responds back to Simeon Theus, and he said, I, sir, had the honor of commanding the battery on that day, and you guys shot me. And Simeon, uh, he goes, whoa, hold on a minute. He said, I don't want to put words in your head, but uh, can you tell me exactly what you're doing in the moment before you were shot? He goes, were you waving a pistol wearing, on a red-colored horse yelling at an officer? And uh, you can see that the, the dawn on the two men. But Simeon goes on to write. He says, I've been telling this story for years. He's like, you were the only officer I was sure I had killed. And... Um, He's like, I've been telling that forever. And uh, it's funny that we have both these letters now in our, our collection from Simeon as well as T. Fred Brown. But Simeon shot T. Fred Brown. And in the letter, one of the letters that T. Fred Brown writes, he says, you couldn't have missed me, because, not just because of the horse I was on, but because I was wearing a white hat. This is the very hat that T. Fred Brown was wearing on July 2nd, 18, 1863, when he was, when he was shot. Um, so it's, um, it's a felt, wool felt. And attached to this hat, now this comes direct from his descendants, um, was a note written his, in his hand stating that this is the hat that he wore at the Battle of Gettysburg when shot on July 2nd, 1863. And he said, a bullet cut away part of the brim. And you can see the little cut, and you see the dark ring around the, the fringe there. If you've ever shot a muzzle-loading black powder gun, low velocity, at a paper target, you'll see on your target, you see this black lead ring. Um, now, it's a strange-looking hat. You wouldn't expect a military officer to be wearing a civilian hat like this. But this is a typical, you can see the battle damage here. Uh, this is a typical slouch hat style of the day. The original maker's labels on the inside of the crown, it was all shredded. Maria's stabilized it, put it back together. We can actually read it now, so we know the manufacturer. But this was manufactured in Paris, France. Um, there, there's a vent on top. This is a summer hat. You know, this is people working outside would have worn a hat like this. And the federal issue forage caps were not necessarily very comfortable. And uh, it's very common. I think it was much more common than we might think that they would wear civilian gear because it was just comfortable 
and uh, just better. You can, you know, provides better sun protection, et cetera. The other amazing thing is that we think, and you're not gonna be able to probably see this um, from home, but in a few spots, we believe there's blood splatter on the outside of the, the crown of the hat. It appears to be from the outside. It actually comes through the, the crown. Um, so we don't know, is it the shot that hit him in the neck or was it someone else that happened to be, to be nearby him? I'm gonna walk around a little bit, just so you guys can get a closer look. It's just, it's an amazing relic um, in the provenance, of course, is rock solid. So that's kind of a neat story. So I'm good friends with a gentleman named Phil De Maria, who is the commander of Battery B, the reenactor group today. And he has been a very passionate historian for Battery B. And uh, so one day, 15 years ago, he's at Gettysburg and he's on Cemetery Ridge, right in the spot where T. Fred Brown was shot, and they're doing a demonstration for, on behalf of the National Park Service. He says a gentleman walked up to him and tapped him on the shoulder and said, uh, hi, um, my wife is a direct descendant of T. Fred Brown. Do you know him? He said, you could have knocked me over with a feather. He almost fainted. And uh, this family, so they had bought, the, there's a house, the, Fred retires to Daytona, Florida, and his house has stayed in the family. And this particular um, husband and wife, they bought this house from another family member in Daytona. And they said in the garage area, it was a dirt floor garage and a box, no climate control, um, was a, all of Fred Brown's stuff. This hat, his forage cap, his frock coat, his Providence Marine Corps, of artillery cadet uniform, his letters, photographs, his great fantastic collection in this box and a dirt floor garage for years. And they knew they're not, they this couple, they're not really into history, but they appreciated the significance, the importance of it. So they had been trying to find a place to put it and they didn't want to give it to a reenactment group. So Phil for years, like twice a year, he would reach out to this family and talk to them and keep the line of communication open. And it was only 15 years later, a few months ago, I got this person's contact info. And I reached out to them, had multiple phone calls, and convinced them to allow the collection to come in to the Barnum Armory Museum and uh, do all the textile conservation on it. And um, here it is today. It's just, a, and the only reason why this family went to Gettysburg is that the husband had a friend who was having a wedding just outside of Gettysburg, and they were just like, ah, let's go check the battlefield out where your ancestor was, and just happened that the first Rhode Island Battery B reenactment group was there. So it's kind of a crazy chain of events. Well, I should have had you advance the slides. Keep going. I'll show you what Fred Brown looks like. So this is a scene from the cyclorama that's at the National Park Service, just to give you a sense of the ferocity of the battle. This is actually a a painting of the third day of the battle, Pickett's Charge. Next slide. All right, so the guy in the lower right is T. Fred Brown. That's what he looked like. And then the guy in the upper left is the, the only picture we've been able to find so far, of Simeon Theus. So Simeon shot him. That's a picture from his obituary in the newspaper. But uh, they continued to write letters after the war, and they became friends. And Fred Brown at one point says, you know, I'm glad you shot me because on the third day of the battle, every artillery officer in the second corps artillery brigade were killed or wounded, or killed actually on the third day. And he's like, you probably saved my life by wounded me that day. But they didn't hold any ill feelings to, towards each other, had re mutual respect. I think that's kind of a lesson for us today. And then uh, I had the honor to actually go to Brown's Gate this past March, February with Fred Brown's hat and actually hold it on that spot. It's the first time this hat has been at Brown's Gate since July 2nd, 1863, I had goosebumps. Um, the only reason, I didn't take it there, it was there for me to pick up, it, long story on that, but um, I was nervous because it was a windy day and I was worried it was gonna blow out of my hands, but it, that was a really cool moment. Next slide. I probably, yeah. How about questions? 
I could keep going for hours. I have more stories to tell. I know I, I recognize some of you. I know some of you definitely have been to the armory recently, um, but you're always welcome back. And uh, anyone that's not been there yet, uh, please request a tour. You can request a tour on our website. Just Google Armory East Greenwich, and you fill out a form, and it goes right to me. And uh, even if it's just one person, two people, don't let that bother you. I'm there all the time. I live very close by. So uh, I hope you guys come and visit. Thank you. Questions? Yes, sir. Yes, it was. Um, in fact, the other object that I had brought in. This is the Bible carried by Alfred G. Gardner that belongs to the South County Museum, incidentally. Show our friends at home. You can see embossed on the cover is the name Alfred G. Gardner. Alfred Gardner was gunner number two on the Gettysburg gun. And he was actually, he was mortally wounded. He died that day from his wound. Um, so let me tell this story quickly. Have you guys, some of you have heard this, I think, some of the, anybody not heard this? Okay, well, for the folks at home. So, Alfred Gardner, he's from Swansea, Mass. He moves to Providence right before the war. He's got five siblings that he loves to death, super devoted to his wife. He's very religious, and he carries his Bible in his sack coat pocket every day of the war. He's a witness to every major battle in the Eastern Theater up until Gettysburg. He survives July 2nd. When Fred Brown is wounded, he survives that attack. But on the third day, um, Robert E. Lee decides to attack the center of the Union line, right where Battery B is positioned. They're right in the center of it. You've probably heard of the Pickett's Charge, uh, where they send 12,000, roughly 12,000 Confederates to attack this center point of the Union line. Preceding that attack, on, at 1 p.m. on July 3rd, Lee masses his artillery across a two-mile front, roughly 130 guns. And at 1 p.m., they began a signal gun goes off, and then they all begin firing at once, focusing their fire on top of Alfred's position. It was described as being the loudest event in human history up until this point in time. And the men talked about the ground literally shook. The artillery fire could be heard as far away as Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, about 35 miles away. So in this barrage, Battery B begins to return fire, and Alfred reaches over the carriage of his gun, and he grabs a cotton bag of gunpowder, and he's turning around to put that bag in the tube. At that moment, a Confederate artillery shell from two miles away arches over the battlefield and smacks the muzzle of the now known as the Gettysburg gun. The shell explodes. It instantly kills gunner number one, William Jones, who's just feet away from Alfred on the other side of the tube, he's decapitated. Alfred has his left arm severed just below the shoulder, and he has a gaping wound in his rib cage, and he goes down on his back, and he's bleeding to death, but he's still conscious. The sergeant of the gun is Albert Strait. He was good friends with Alfred. Albert writes that he bends down to, to Alfred. He said they grabbed hands. And he said the first words out of Alfred's mouth was, please tell my wife I died happy. And then he says, please make sure she gets my Bible. So Albert says they, they quickly bid farewell, and Albert turns his back, and he hears Alfred yell out in a loud and clear voice, glory be to God, hallelujah, amen, amen. And then he pleads out, and he dies. On July 4th, we don't know whether Albert couldn't bring himself to do it because of their friendship, but Albert asked another salt, another guy, to go over to Alfred's body and pull his Bible out of his pocket, this Bible. And uh, they get Albert gets the Bible back. He mails it to Alfred's widow, and he writes a letter explaining how Alfred dies. This whole story, and they bury the two men in a hole on July 4th in front of their gun. They mark the grave. Apparently, Alfred had a premonition that he was not going to survive this particular battle. This was not an uncommon thing that would happen. And he asked his men specifically to mark his grave so that his family could find him. In 
2010, a letter was discovered at the Rhode Island Historical Society written by Alfred's brother talking about going to Gettysburg two weeks after the battle, finding his brother's grave, digging him up, if you can imagine, and then bringing him back home to Swansea to be buried with the rest of the family. When you read the inscriptions in the Bible, uh, I didn't mention that. So he used the Bible as a diary. So in the margins of the pages, he would write little messages to his children, words of wisdom, words of advice, emotionally charged stuff. And you, you, when you read these things, you, you know why it was so important to him. His last dying words were to please make sure my Bible goes back to my wife. The last entry, which I've seen with my own eyes, is dated July 2nd, 1863, Gettysburg, in battery, all ready for action. I am well in body and my mind is clear about the future. The thought of heaven has cheered me on this march from Falmouth to Pennsylvania. Then he writes, children, exclamation point, always be of good cheer and always do right. This is the wish of your father. That was the, the last thing that he wrote. Um, so it's, a, it's amazing. I'm so thankful that you allow us to, to display this with the other Battery B objects. Um, I'm actually talking uh, with people in the state government, Secretary of State Nellie Gorbia, um, her Secretary of Education, about uh, putting the Gettysburg on display in the Varnum Armory with T. Fred Brown, with Alfred Gardner's Bible and other Battery B objects that we have. It would be a pretty epic display. Thank you so much, Patrick, for joining us. We sincerely appreciate not just the presentation, but everything you and your group have done to preserve the service of those Rhode Islanders. Thank you. And if you do get the DNA evidence, I know that there's quite a few people in the Rhode Island Genealogical Society who would like to help prove out that tree for you. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, and if you're still interested and curious, please don't stop tonight. Keep going. Tomorrow, the South County Museum is open, and we'd love for you to come and see the Sprague Knotchet Corner, which includes quite a few artifacts, including an articulated prosthesis leg. Yep, that's right, it's a, it's a wooden leg. And also, if you are interested, you could get the opportunity for an exclusive tour on Sunday at the Varnum, linked with this, a perfect way to bookend and end the first Civil War week in Rhode Island. If you're interested, it does require an RSVP. Go online at southcountymuseum.org. And we very much look forward to seeing all of you again. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.